This is about all of us around the world. You know, put your differences aside, where you grew up, what language you speak, what religion you believe in. This is about humanity. Sports can be a vehicle for systematic change, global change. Hey folks, I'm Connor Gaughan, and welcome to Consensus in Conversation, a podcast where we talk with innovators, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders who are committed to building successful businesses that also help us build a better world. Today is October 6th, and since 2016, that means it's Green Sports Day. It's an opportunity for the worldwide sports community, teams, owners, athletes, and fans to raise awareness about environmental sustainability and celebrate the power that sports have to bring us all together to make a positive impact in the world. Think about how many people in your own life are directly connected to the sports world in some way, whether it's athletes, parents of an athlete, or just crazy fanatics about their team. I'm guessing it's most of us out there, and that number is pretty darn high. Sports are a huge part of the fabric of our everyday lives. Now, think about how much of a difference could be made if all those people connected to sports committed to making just a 1% reduction in their carbon footprint. If each of us planted a tree or worked to clean up our community, even just remembered to take the recycling out. Well, that's what Green Sports Day is all about. It's harnessing the unique, connective power of sports to try and build a more sustainable future. So, in honor of Green Sports Day 2023, we thought it would be the perfect time to repost the conversation we had earlier this year with Roger McClendon, the executive director of the Green Sports Alliance. Not only has Roger been a standout athlete himself, he's a member of the University of Cincinnati Athletics Hall of Fame for basketball and is still their all-time single-season record holder in the three-point percentage, but he's also been a pioneer in business sustainability, serving as the first ever chief sustainability officer for Yum! Brands, and developing a sustainability guide for restaurants that's still used in over 5,000 locations globally. Roger was an amazing and inspiring guest, and I think that even if you've heard this conversation before, it's worth another listen. Roger gave us so much wisdom on leadership and building collaboration, and just the way we think about sustainability in our day-to-day lives that I think it's worth revisiting, especially on Green Sports Day. So without further ado, here's our conversation with Roger. Thanks for joining us today. Um, we'd love to just start off with a little bit of your personal background. Tell folks about your upbringing. Yeah, but first of all, Connor, thank you for being here. It's a pleasure. I'm super excited. So I'll, I'll share a little bit of my background. Um, very competitive growing up and kind of grew up um, like most people with challenges, right? And so yeah. um, it kind of sets your personality um, when you kind of face some of those so personal challenges. So grew up around a lot of you know, alcoholism and drug abuse and those kind of things. And what I looked to was sports to kind of pull me out of that. And I was really inspired by watching folks like Muhammad Ali at the time, people like Roberto Clemente, those guys that had not just a passion for the sport and how sport really kind of could uplift you and inspire you, but they actually had social conscience. They, they understood the importance of community and understood the importance of people. And that really made an impression on me. So yeah. fighting my way through those challenges, you know, I got lucky. Uh, m- my father, you know, really kind of focused in on education. He's an educator by trade. So I had a lot of guidance and, and, and my mom the same way, very hard workers. And that guidance helped me position not just sports, but the educational piece. Blessed with a little natural ability, I guess. I was a skinny kid growing up, but I uh, had long arms, uh, could jump, could run. And so I was very athletic <laughs> in basketball. Um, and so that's kind of what I gravitated toward uh, and was able to be challenged and pushed since my dad was a professor at the local university. Nice. Uh, growing up there, um, I actually played against older players. And so I kind of got a little savvy for the game uh, as well. And I pushed myself and discovered that I love math and science. And so I kind of tracked on the engineering side. Yep. Um, my father had a student that was in his class and had a chance to talk to him. And I was really I- impressed with, you know, trying to solve some of the challenges that we were facing at the time. So that mentorship is so critical and, and important and underappreciated, I think. Those chance encounters that become, you know, your inspiration 10, 20, 30 years down the road. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and you know this when you, you know, there's certain things as a kid that you remember that just warm your heart or you kind of make those impressions and to be able to leverage those in your future is, is really important. And that's kind of what I've been able to do throughout my career. So I say sports 
education and social conscious were all those seeds that were planted really, really early. Awesome. And I kind of lived through uh, what that means to struggle uh, and to see other folks struggle uh, and to figure out what we can do as a generation and as really as kind of a human rights perspective for others. Yeah, I'm dying to hear because everyone has it. Your athletic University of Cincinnati basketball glory day story. What's the story that if your family were here, they're like, oh, here he goes. This is the one. This is the story. Yeah, yeah. I, I had some great moments. I was McDonald's All-American top 25 in, in the nation and uh, was recruited from, you know, every university you can think of, over 250 scholarship offers. And so, you know, one that was really impressive was UCLA and, and getting to meet John Wooden, who yeah. is one of the most famous, not just coaches, but leaders of all time, who actually with his teams, you know, broke through the color barrier. He decided not to go to the tournament when he was at Purdue and because he had an African-American player and they wouldn't host him in the same hotel, uh, he decided not to go to the tournament. And they did that two years in a row. So that sacrifice was really important. And so I landed at University of Cincinnati under auspices of, it was the first university in 1906 to start the cooperative program in engineering. And it also had Oscar Robertson as one of its all-time players to kind of yeah. get them to the national championships. But they never got there with him, but they did win in 61 and 62. So that was the foundation of me saying, okay, how do I choose all of these different schools? What combination did I look at? And jumping into that sport, you know, Louisville was a big competitor. So I ended up beating the national championships as a team. I think we had, you know, I had a significant number of points, um, <laughs> but we actually ended up beating that team that won the national championship. So that's probably one of the games people most remember. Yeah. And then you graduate. I'd love to hear a little bit about your career trajectory. How did you get from uh, the courts to the offices? Yeah, through that run was folks that ran into Dale Curry, the dad of two players that you know, Seth and Steph, played against them. And um, during my career at Cincinnati, my trajectory in engineering happened because of the co-op program. So I was able to work with the companies like Procter & Gamble, uh, very close to making the pro teams, but didn't quite do it. But I had a backup plan. Yeah, I got a chance to see the power of, of my major. Um, talking about analytics and AI and, and all the things you talk about today. And that led me into the love for understanding efficiencies and sustainability as a part of that. Yeah. And you eventually make your way to Young Brands and, yeah. and climb the ranks to Chief Sustainability Officer. Um, and what are some of the highlights of that part of the career? Yeah. So transitioning from manufacturing and, and working in, in strictly mostly in engineering and system design, I got a phone call from a guy that said, hey, come take a look at uh, KFC. And I was like, hmm, what is that? And he was like, oh, it's Kentucky Fried Chicken. And, you know, working on high-tech systems, I was kind of thinking, what does restaurants have to do with technology? But I was really intrigued. It was They were owned at that time by PepsiCo before they became young brands. And this person, I had actually done some cooperative work in, in Costa Rica and Ecuador while I was still at University of Cincinnati as part of the co-op program. So really trusted him. And I was really intrigued with a consumer facing brand um, that had a purpose, right? They were really, Pepsi was a really front facing brand doing a lot of things with supplier diversity. And so um, I took a leap of faith and and joined in and then worked my way up through that system to become the chief sustainability officer. And a guy by the name of David Novak, who was the chairman, CEO, um, recognized my passion. And uh, I presented to him a concept because I came in as an engineer, worked on food development, new product development. But what happened was I was able to grow within that environment. As some of the lessons that I think I love to share with the audience was about people capability first, uh, and then everything else would follow, including for-profits companies would be profitability. Um, but also being a purpose-driven company, not just there for profits. And I think that was what I was looking for, was people that had heart, yeah. um, in addition to understanding how to drive a business. And remembering the timeline, you really were one of the early chief sustainability officers at a major corporation. And in an industry that we all know and love, you know the fast food industry, the food and beverage industry, where our daily to day lives, we have a lot of interaction with those brands and there's a lot of opportunity to make sustainability uh, more 
prominent part of those transactions and interactions. So give us a little bit of the takeaways that you walked away from that career learning. The, the key for me was the leadership um, that we had. The company are the people that run the company. That becomes the company, right? As I was growing and learning the business, you know, I discovered that my passion to be a leader was around the heart. It was around making an impact in, in, on people. And so I think I was able to combine the need for the business, which was critical because risk mitigation, understanding your supply chain, minimizing your cost, and doing, doing the right things for the community to, to drive people to your company, to be attracted to work for your company, to be a good company, was everything that I cared about. And I, I, I kind of presented that to to David Novak, the CEO at the time, and said, you know, we're missing this in our company. You know, we, we're okay on the philanthropic side. It's great to give, but you really need an intricate, integrated business strategy around sustainability that's going to drive the value of our company. And it's going to do good things for the environment at the same time. And so it was, it was positioned in a way where I don't think they could say no. And I was able to build a team, uh, able to build a global strategy around how we were going to buy and purchase our goods to understand how we manage not just quality, but the sustainability initiatives of our suppliers. When you think about greenhouse gas emissions and the details of the engineering behind what you need to do, it's really about the design and taking care of that supply chain in addition to your operations. At the time, it it was kind of like, how do you integrate your building standards as you're building to more LEED certifiable type standards around the world? This is including China, you know, Europe, you know, uh, Russia at the time, all those companies, how do you do universal standards to make sure you can impact sustainability as most effectively as possible? Um, we were able to get on the Dow Jones Sustainability Index. Um, we were able to, you know, create uh, momentum in our supply chain for folks to be able to measure that. And it, it was really fantastic. It was challenging. Uh, I won't say it was easy because alignment, <laughs> yeah. profitability is a big thing. If you can't make profit, then you don't exist as a company. So it's not an or conversation is an and conversation. We've done a lot of content and, and mostly videos, stories around various components of the food industry who are innovating around food waste. And sometimes and often there's an interesting crossover with food insecurity. And so there's a ton of really great stories that we've been telling. And I love hearing about um, big and small businesses in the food space that are both attacking sustainability, but also attacking food insecurity at the same time and finding community value, uh, creative solutions that are also good on the sustainability side and aren't costing the company anything at all. It's, it's a win-win-win, which we really love. Now, sustainability is a broad category. We talked about the social and environmental, but when you think about the health and the people aspects of it, that's part of it. So making sure you have menu diversification, uh, choices that are, are more healthy than other choices. And then when you try to deal with waste, things that could be reused and provided to the community for local food shelters, food banks, um, and, and integrating your systems into that for value of f- what folks need. I think we were able to do that. And on a global stage, you know, bringing to folks' attention the awareness of starvation and food insecurity around the world. So being able to work with the United Nations Food World Food Program was another thing that we were able to do. So tying all those things together and thinking about sustainability in a more broader yeah. Uh, perspective, you're able to make some impact. You mentioned the people are the company. I love that line. And obviously the the values of the leadership trickle down and really drive company decisions and strategy. I know you've got a great value statement or a great approach that you've termed F squared, C squared. And I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about that and how it uh, squares, if you will, with your work now at, at GSA. Yeah, my wife calls me the biggest nerd. She said, "Well, you're talking about that F squared C squared stuff again." <laughs> said, well, no, it come it really evolved out of a leadership development opportunity that Yum afforded me. Um and I was in Vancouver and it was really a week long kind of intensive get to know yourself and you know, when you get up caught up in the day to day and you you have your challenges, you kind of forget what's really important to you. Yeah. Um, and sometimes you're chasing, you know, most people may be chasing a position or, you know, money. And, you know, I kind of wanted to step back and that class helped me step back and say, what are, what is really important to you, Roger? You know, how do you really want to impact the business? And I was offered, it's really a general management weed out (laughs) class at the (laughs) end of the day. And I passed the class. They saw that I had this, you know, the leadership style that 
was beneficial to the company. And, you know, it was really a wonderful, wonderful course. And out of that evolved this F squared, C squared for me, that was my authentic leadership style. So F squared, faith, family. So that's the F squared. C squared is community, career. So my career was fourth on my priority list. And I actually presented that back to my CEO. And he, he said, I love this because we know where you stand. I don't want to run the China business, David. I, I want to create this sustainability role and make a difference in our business, both for our customers, you know, um, for our financials and, and for what we can do for the environment and the community. Yeah. And so I think he, he fell in love with that and uh, he made me the chief sustainability officer, the first one ever of the company. That's awesome. <laughs> and also, I mean... We, we talked a little bit about it at our brand, Root and Vine, but it also, I think sustainability is such a strong connection to, to just stewardship for the land and, and, and caring for creation in a way that is important to many faiths, which that certainly is one of the, one of the ways that I got in, into the space was just believing that like you go outside and there's, this is worth protecting, this is worth taking care of, this is worth giving to the next generation better than, than I got it, you know? We always talk global. We always say, okay, this is global change. But you know, reality is it's it's all about local. Yeah. You, you got to start in your backyard. You got to start local before you can think about global. And that local really investment into the community and how we live and having clean air and clean water is kind of how I evolved into leveraging sports into this next level of opportunity that I had to make an impact. You know, everybody, when we think about playing for the next generation, my my transition from Yum, you know, as a corporate leader and thinking global to really getting back to my roots in sports, got me that connection into what we'll talk about next, I'm sure, is the Green Sports Alliance. Next um, question. But yeah, that's the (laughs) local, yeah. So that local piece is really important. Yeah. So, I mean, that is the perfect segue. Tell us about the Green Sports Alliance. Maybe give us the background. Yeah. So at Yum, I actually was in a conference and I heard this guy speaking about how sports can influence the world. And I, and I believe that, you know, cause I think about Muhammad Ali, I think about Pele and I think about, you know, Roberto Clemente, folks that wanted to leverage their power to, to see people view yeah. them as this leader, right? To influence them in a certain way. So, um, Alan Hertzowitz was the guy that I heard speak and he was working with the NHL and he was talking about how NHL had adopted the NHL green standards, you know, around how they were going to operate. And Commissioner Bettman, who's probably the longest standing commissioner in any major sport. Um, was bought in and he's, you know, he's just that personality, right? He cares, you know, it's not just about the game and about the dollars and the players. It's about what we do to give back. And so I think that, you know, kind of stuck in my mind. And so when I retired, I was working on, you know, kind of some mentoring ship and I mentored quite a few people throughout Yum. Um, and then this opportunity came by and I was like, wow, I'm very interested. And I presented. And the thing about my presentation though, with the board at the time, this was a lot of people that were interested in the role. Um, I remember doing a Zoom call and, and talking about close your eyes. Imagine now someone has a, a death grip around their throat yeah. and you're, you, you, you can't breathe. You, you literally, you, you're trying to struggle, but you can't breathe. And I wanted them to know that sustainability is not just about changing light bulbs and about, you know, picking up waste, you know, it really is centered around people and community at the end of the day. At the at the largest scale, which we hear, you know, at the World Economic Forum, and we hear our leaders talking, you know, one passionate in particular is like, this is about all of us around the world. You know, put your differences aside, where you grew up, what language you speak, what religion you believe in. This is about humanity. Sports, can be a vehicle for systematic change, global change. Yeah. Back to your last statement too. It, it also has incredible power locally, right? I think about coaches. And my grandfather was a coach. Like that was his career. He was a high school football coach and then and then an administrator. Those are people that have such an impact on the communities, on their schools, on the kids that they educate, that they coach, that they mentor. Um, that it really exports at every level of, of, of every sport in every country has this incredible connection with us and power to make the local communities better, the individuals that comprise those communities better. And then at the grand scale, I think you're right, the world, it, it can drive systemic change at the global level. What Give us the origin story of, of Green Sports Alliance. Where did it come from? It's, it's um, 
a couple of stories kind of built into one and um it really it developed on the west coast uh through the paul allen foundation their group and it was an internal foundation that was more focused on the philanthropic side and they really challenged themselves and came to leadership and said you know we own the trailblazers and the seahawks and you know these teams, sports teams, because they just purchased them. It's like, why are we not doing more in sustainability? So that was the challenge there. Uh, and this was our six originating bodies. And then there was a kind of a movement that I've heard about on the East Coast with the Lori family around um, this issue of where they were sourcing their toilet paper from was causing destruction of eagle habitat. And it was like, when they found that out, kind of light bulb went off like the crisis, right? Yeah. You can't, that can't happen, right? How, how has that happened? Who's responsible? So those two movements came together um, about you know 13 years ago, roughly, and formed the Green Sports Alliance. And so Scott Jenkins is probably the longest standing. He's our uh, past board chair position, was the board chair for 12 years and started out with the Green Sports Alliance uh, and kind of built it up from there. So, yeah, it's been fantastic to jump in. It's a 19 person board. Um, you know, we, we had Bob Netting who was the owner of the Pittsburgh pirates. I mean, got Jamie Zanzanovich who is the assistant commissioner of the PAC 12. So you've got lots and lots of powerful individuals that care about this and support the green sports Alliance. Can you walk us through the types of stakeholders you've got? Cause you've got a variety of them and they each kind of come with different power and potential, um, so who comprises, who are the kinds of orgs and, and people and companies and teams and, you know, who all's in? The yeah, alliance? yeah. It's, it's the largest sport and sustainability organization in the world. And it's kind of spun off some ideas where there's others uh, growing out there around the globe. But our stakeholders are, number one, our board members. And then you look at our staff, which is a really small staff. And then from there, it becomes our membership base. And in, in our membership based on the collegiate as well as the professional side, it's almost everybody you can think of. It's not 100 percent inclusive, but we're working on it, you know, as people are different places. But leagues like the NBA, NFL, NHL, MLB, MLS, you know, World Surf League, Athletes Unlimited, yep. PGA. It's a really big group of almost every league you think of that's committed to be a member at various leadership yep. levels. And then you have kind of the pieces that touch sport that not necessarily the sports themselves. And that is like the ESPNs of the world, the Foxes of the world. Sure. Uh, and then you have the collegiate side. So the PAC 12 uh, SEC schools, you know, if you don't have a whole c- conference, if they're not evolved yet to be a whole conference in, then it's the individual schools that are in, um, and then you have what I call the solutions providers, which are really the businesses. You talk about small businesses and large businesses that are working in the space of sustainability to provide solutions, whether it be um, renewable energy solutions, you know, water quality insights, you know, so knowledge based companies, um, consultants that support the Green Sports Alliance and are part of that membership as well. Um, so those are really our constituents. And then you have the NGOs. And so we work with the EPA uh NRDC, which is National Research Defense Fund. Um, so BEF, Environmental Environmental Foundation. So a lot of foundations and organizations that are really specific around sustainability and what they can do around the environmental stewardship side of this. One of the stakeholders that you touched on, but I want to dig in on just a little bit more because I think they're an incredibly big part of the sports infrastructure is governments, right? The EPA you mentioned. Obviously, federal, state, and municipal governments play a big role in things like stadiums and municipal bonds that pay for stadiums. And I'm curious where you're seeing those stakeholders stepping up and how they can step up a little bit more. Yeah. I mean, I think world leadership, you know, we just talked about the world economic forum and, and kind of the change in leadership that we've, we've had here in the position around sustainability and stepping up to the facts of climate is real, climate change is real. And what does that really mean for resiliency and what we have to do? So the administration pumped billions of dollars into, you know, this space. And so for those folks yeah. that jump into that space, those incentives are really important. How I build a stadium, where I build my stadium. And then let's not forget, like we said, is, you know, this is for my father and understanding social justice and environmental justice and all those things that have always been important and always have been around 
you know, we need to continue to do that and make sure that that's happening yeah. as we start to think about those investments. I love the story about, again, local, you know, it's, it, sustainability has been practiced, but if you overfish and you overdo things, then the whole city kind of just dwindles away of people and livelihoods yeah. too. So that's, that's the same for here, whether you're inner city or you're in the rural area, everybody wants those same opportunities. They, they don't want to be left yeah. out of those opportunities. So how do you become equitable in that when you have economic development? How do you make sure people benefit from that? And they're just not overlooked or pushed out or through gentrification moved out and then they don't get a chance to participate. Well, it seems like as those investments flow into across the country, everywhere, there is added business opportunity to engage in a sustainable fashion, right? Um, you talked a lot about your belief about the opportunity for profit and impact to align, but I'm curious if you can talk a little bit more about how you see the current moment as an opportunity for the private sector and the investments coming from the public sector. How can we harness all that in partnership, um, particularly when it comes to the sports sector? Yeah, I think we have to be collaborative. If we think about the summit that we have to talk about that, how do you leverage sponsorship and partnership You know, with private and public opportunities in the community to lift everybody up. Uh, And so I think providing those jobs and making sure those are really good paying jobs when we talk about the industry of sports, um, giving, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, the right opportunity, right. In an authentic way of how you uh, hire, how you, you know, promote um, and how you maintain and retain people and how do you develop talent? Um, So, so I think there's opportunities for sure because, Cities have to compete, right? They have to balance the budget like states kind of do, right? And so, yeah. so when you when you think about bringing everybody in that equation and thinking about how to compete for these large scale events like FIFA and, and and the Olympics that are coming, it could benefit the whole community. And so, you want to be stronger than when you started. Uh, and I think by taking that approach, you know, and having that compassion and that understanding about equity, and you know, I, I think that helps. I, I think it helps drive change. What can fans do? How do we get fans uh, active in uh, the sustainability of their own communities, teams, stadiums? Yeah, I think there's lots of things that, you know, we're exploring. You know, one of the things I didn't touch on is, you know, when you got into food waste, that is probably a massive issue around the, the, the country. And understanding composting, understanding basic infrastructure that needs to be invested in in the city if it's not there. So, you know, fans can push their local government, you know, and say, hey, why don't we have these services? You know, we need these services. Um, I think the interaction, and and this is always a a struggle. So when I'm at my game, I kind of am focused on the team, right? I'm not, I don't want to be bum brushed with like, where do I put my cup necessarily? So reusables have been experimenting with, right? So it becomes simpler or there's an incentive when I do put, you know, that reusable where it needs to go or that recycle where it needs to go, can I get recognized? And so I think there's some some fun engagements and campaigns that can happen. Um, we just came off of college football playoffs, um, which was in LA. Uh, and so understanding not what you can just do at the game, but what happens after the game. So we were able to capture a, a, a part of the the field that was used for uh, their championship tailgate and make sure it got reused at a park. That's awesome, uh, and that was that was fantastic, right? And so there's ways not just with food waste, but other materials that can be recaptured and reused. That I think is really important to engage fans and the community to be a part of that. My father um, played football at the Air Force Academy, and, and then once he re- retired from the service, we had maybe ten years of season tickets. I think that. 25, 30 years later, they're still working their way through those cups that they got at every single game. <laughs> you know, they have kept those things. They, for, they're doing well. They're saving money yeah, too at the same time, exactly. right? And so, yeah, I mean, sometimes. Never paid for cups in our life. Yeah, what's old is new, right? I mean, it's like, yep. didn't we used to do this? Wasn't like a milk jug <laughs> thing that we used to use and do you reuse? Or what about those bottles? You know, so I, so I do think there's uh, technology. There's sometimes new disruptive technology or re spinning the technology, but you, for system thinking, it, sometimes you don't have the scale or enough 
people bought in yet to get the infrastructure investments that you need so you can get to scale. And I think that's where sports can play a role because when it was COVID, you know, those stadiums were turning to voting centers, Mercedes-Benz Stadium, Levi Stadium. Yeah. They were turned into food donation outlets where people can come because we were struggling, right, as a country uh, in the world, right? And so the stadium, it, it's connected to community. It's yeah. a part of the community. So I think stepping up to that responsibility, which we've seen demonstrated in many ways, we don't have to just do that in crisis. We could do that every day. Um, and I think that's where we got to get into a normalcy of where sustainability is not this thing on the side. It's integrated into how we live. And what fans and people can do as I look in the mirror to make myself better is to make those sacrifices, you know, as to go the extra mile for the sake of what we call playing for the next generation. That next generation um, is that the, uh, the earth is healthy and it's livable and the, the water's clean and the air is clean. Um, and, and that's all our responsibilities at the end of the day. I spent a lot of time thinking and talking about this question of how do we defeat defeatism? You know, it, it's hard. What needs to happen is hard. And what needs to happen requires involvement and and participation from everybody. Like everyone's going to have to sacrifice a little bit. Everyone's going to have to give a little bit. Everyone's going to have to contribute a lot. Um, if we're really going to, you know, make the change that we need to make to to leave you know, the land and water better for the next generation and, and on the right path. And, you know, I, I do fear sometimes there's so much negativity out there on, you know, the IPCC says this is going to happen and COP27 worries that that's about to happen. Like, it's really hard um, to keep positive. And so one of the things that I'm adamant about and the reason that I do this podcast and find great people like you and, and um, the Green Sports Alliance is, you know, you are the antidote. You are the stories that inspire, that give people something to do, too. They give people something to, to recognize that it's possible and, and we're going to all, you know, that everyone's doing it, we're going to do it together. Um, so thank you for that. It's, I think, really critical to just keeping spirits high and moving in the right direction. We have Green Sports Day on October 6th, which was provided to us by the Obama administration, where we recognize all the great things that are happening of our members, you know, across the, the world, really, in this green sports space. We were able to light stadiums green and bring awareness to this is this is real. That's what sports is all about. It's about inspiration and achieving what people don't think can be achieved, you know, whether it's, you know, running the, the mile in less than, you know, four minutes that people are like, well, that has never happened, you know, and, and we can. Yeah. And so I, that, that in, it, it inspires me too, because it's not, we, we're talking about action now because we, we have awareness, right? And I think by yep. bringing that store stories to life about people putting things in action, I really believe you create the future. And by, Having that mindset, and I think it starts with mindset, then defeatism is not an option. Failure is not an option. It is about how are we going to solve this and how are we going to win uh, as, as humanity. That's outstanding. I actually think that's the perfect way to end. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Sports is all about inspiration. And yeah, we're all on the same team on this one. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit of what we do and in, in, in how we facilitate Thanks for listening to this special episode of Consensus and Conversation. Hope you have a happy Green Sports Day. Check out the show notes for more about the Green Sports Alliance and upcoming events around the country and in your neck of the woods. Huge thanks to Roger McClendon for the inspiring conversation. Consensus and Conversation is hosted by me, Connor Gaughan. The episode is produced by Will Gatchell and Chandler Bramstead. Executive produced by me with editing from Reasonable Volume. Special thanks to Consensus Creative Director, Kate Tucker. Don't forget to like and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. We'll see you next week.